This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special opportunity for our viewers to hear from the uh, about tax policy and about education in a way that's going to keep them just on the edge of their chairs wanting <laughs> to know more. The Commonwealth Institute for Fiscal Analysis. We have Michael Cassidy, the president here, and two other staffers. But before I introduce them, why don't you tell our viewers something about Commonwealth Institute for Fiscal Analysis. What, what is that nonprofit organization? Sure. We are a nonprofit policy research organization. We were founded in 2006 to look at state fiscal and economic policy issues, particularly with a focus on how they affect middle class and low income Virginians. So we look at all kinds of issues around the state budget, tax policy, issues regarding safety net programs, investments in key public services like health care and education. And as an independent organization, we're bringing rigorous analysis to the public debates on these important issues here in our state. And Laura Gorn, yes, <laughs> research director. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure, um, I work on a lot of the sort of big picture issues, such as um, whether um, state revenues are keeping up with what we need to invest in our public services. And then I also um, particularly work on immigration and juvenile justice and some of our um, safety net issues like uh, SNAP and TANF. And Chris Duncan, you've been on this week in Richmond some time ago. <laughs> well, yes. Welcome back. Senior policy analyst, what does that mean? Um, it means that I, I get the opportunity to really focus in and do analysis on education and workforce training policy um, and also get to speak and discuss kind of what the, the lawmakers are looking at and um, try to make it accessible to, to folks as they're tuning in. Excellent, excellent. There's, there's conversations going on throughout the United States about what's going to be happening on tax policy on the federal level. And there seems to always be that conversation going on in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But, but now, particularly before the election, there are different policies that each of the three candidates for governor have, uh, have uh, put up and made available on their websites, have talked about. And we want to have you break it down some the three of you for our viewers so they can know about the, the both the revenue and the, the spending side of the, of the three policies because one of them will be the next governor of the Commonwealth. Absolutely. And of course, this all revolves around this critical issue, which is how much resources do we need to make the investments in public services that we know are the building blocks to a strong economy, like an educated workforce, like an infrastructure that allows people to get to and from work and allows businesses to get their goods and services out to market. Um, things like a health care system uh, throughout the state so that folks have access uh, that they need to health care, which is, we know, critical for having not only just an educated workforce, but a healthy workforce. And so one of the key issues related to all that is how much revenue a state has and how are we um, structuring our revenue system, who are we taxing, and in what ways. And as you mentioned, in this campaign cycle for the governor's race in Virginia, 
there is a ho there are a host of proposals about that. Um, Laura has taken a deep dive into those issues. Good. Sure. Um, so if we look at all three candidates, they've proposed a variety of tax cuts and then also some language around um, tax reform or taking a look at tax loopholes. Um, I think when you look at their tax cut plans, um, uh, Mr. Gillespie's campaign has uh, proposed cutting the individual income tax rates by 10% each. And both their campaign and some independent analysis we worked on um, shows that would end up costing about $1.4 billion when it's fully phased in in a couple of years if it became law. Um, and that really has to be weighed um, in the context of the fact that state revenues have not kept up in general with the growing state economy or with our public needs. And that's why we've had um, even during the current economic uh, recovery and growth period, we've had shortfalls and um, the legislature and governor has not been able to invest in things that everybody agrees is needed. Um, for example, education funding, while we've made a little bit of progress recently turning a corner, um, we're still not back where we were before the recession. And if you look across a variety of public services, the same is true. Um, the transportation package that was passed in 2013 um, under the McDonald administration, that was certainly an attempt to move forward and raise revenues that were needed to address Virginia's very real <laughs> transportation challenges. Um, but it hasn't raised the amount expected, basically because gas prices haven't done what people expected, which was increase. Um, so we haven't really had a successful um, attempt or to, well, we've had attempts, but they haven't been successful to deal with Virginia's revenue challenges in many, many years. So then when you turn around and have a variety of proposals to deeply cut revenues, the question is what are you going to cut to pay for that? Or what other taxes will you raise to make up for that lost revenue? And unfortunately, I think we've mostly seen wishful thinking from all three campaigns around um, economic growth making up for that. Now, in addition yeah. um, to Ed Gillespie's proposals, yeah. uh, Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam also has a set of proposals on revenue, too, that might be worth talking about for a minute because they also, um, they're different than what um, Ed Gillespie's proposing. Sure. Um, the Lieutenant Governor has proposed um, to eliminate Virginia's uh, sales tax on groceries, um, either all of it or the state portion of it. Um, it's a little unclear. Um, to me, ex the exact details of the proposal. Um, we uh, have done some analysis showing that eliminating the state portion of that sales tax would cost about $380 million, which, um, well, it's not $1.4 billion, it does raise many of the same questions. Um, interestingly, if you look at those two proposals and who they would cut taxes on and who they would um, impact the most. Um, they're fairly similar in terms of how much of a tax cut the average middle income Virginia would see, someone with uh, about forty to sixty thousand dollars of income. Um, but if you look at low income and then high income people, the impacts are very different because low income people pay a higher share of their income towards the grocery tax than high income people and vice versa for the income tax. Um, and then the third candidate, of course, I don't want to uh, forget to mention, uh, Mr. Hira has a tax cut plan also. Um, he proposes to very significantly increase the standard deduction um, for both individuals and uh, married couples. Um, and that would cost, depending on the details of what else he did, between three and five billion dollars. So uh, an even more significant loss of state revenue from that. The, on your website you have uh, a half sheet, mm -hmm. the blog, and the viewers can go on there and can see some nice graphs for for each of these, that just mm -hmm. you know, just the facts yeah. of wh what they're proposing. Interesting, I guess, in a campaign season, all three candidates are proposing some sort of tax cut. Yes, tax cuts are are um, all <coughs> often viewed by politicians as being you know popular uh, with the electorate, and so it's not uncommon that you see proposals along these lines during election cycle. But as Laura mentioned. The core issue remains, how do we have the resources that we need to pay for the services that the public um, expects and that we know are critical to having a strong economy? States have to balance their budget. 
states can't run deficits like the federal government can. And so as a result, this issue of what are you going to cut in order to make room for uh, a tax cut is really critical and always relevant, um, particularly because Virginia has seen relatively modest economic growth during this recovery. The idea that you could just grow your way out of being able to afford a multi-billion dollar tax cut, for example, is even more difficult to, um, to really um, put your hands around when you think about the long-standing um, budget challenges the state has faced in this recovery. I, and I think the last thing I wanted to mention was it is certainly encouraging that um, all of the campaigns have called for taking a look at tax preferences and special tax giveaways and doing some sort of tax reform. Um, obviously the devil is in the details on those. Um, everybody wants to cut somebody else's giveaway and not their own. Um, so I think that we do need to have a serious conversation in this state about the um, giveaways and other tax preferences. Um, they're certainly what makes doing your taxes complicated. It's not you know, the tax brackets that makes doing your taxes complicated. It's, it's all of the different um, deductions and credits. Um, so taking a serious look at that and having conversations is very needed. I'm very glad the candidates are talking about that, um, but it's going to take hard work because it's very tough to accomplish. You know, every few years, it seems like there's um, discussion about uh, sales tax on services mm -hmm. and what, what we are, what we do have sales tax on the Commonwealth and what we don't have. Right. And, um, yes. and, and then, as you say, the, the details seem to get bogged down and it has, it has to go through the legislature, yeah. through both chambers before the governor can then sign off on it. Right. And nothing seems to change. And when you think about some of these uh, credits or preferential rates, these uh, that um, uh, preferences that Laura mentioned, you know, they got there for a reason. There's a mobilized constituency mm -hmm. that uh, special interest that got them into the tax code uh, to begin with. And so you always have to take on that challenging political interest because to reform them is to bring in more revenue for the state so that the benefits of that are widely dispersed among all Virginians. But to reform them has concentrated costs with the special interests that got them in the tax code to begin with. So it's a big challenge. But on top of it, as you mentioned, you know, our economy has changed dramatically in, um, over the last few decades. And there's a lot of indicators to, s to show that Virginia's revenue system really isn't oriented to a modern 21st century economy. For example, you mentioned sales tax on services. You know, the economy has changed from one where we manufacture stuff to th where, we have, where we sell and, and consume services. But we don't typically tax those. And um, thinking about how you have a tax system that's oriented to where the economy itself is, is a key question that I think lawmakers and policy officials in Virginia um, have to continue to wrestle with in order to have the resources we need uh, for a growing state with growing needs. Mm -hmm. The last time I heard the governor speak just a week or so ago, he was talking about a, a small hole that he's got to fill in the budget he leaves because Congress has failed once more to act on giving states the authority to tax the sales of purchases over the internet. Mm -hmm. And while I do not do any work for the retailers, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I do do some purchasing, as I imagine that most every, each of yeah. you and most everyone watching would do. It, it's it's not an an equal playing field for those who have who have businesses in the Commonwealth yeah. who must charge. And then the question about so I think he said it was what eighty or ninety yeah. million dollar hole he's got to fill yeah. because of Congress not acting. Uh, let's let's also get you some comments about what what if what what if there's some action at the federal level uh, your institute is one of about 40 around the, the country yeah. that analyzes state revenues and taxes and policies but aren't we somewhat under the gun as to so what may or may not happen in Washington with regards to tax policies and sequestration sure. and all yeah. of that. Absolutely. There's a strong connection between what's happening at the federal level and Virginia's economy, Virginia's state budget, 
and Virginia State Revenue System. In a lot of ways, the federal taxes and state taxes are intertwined. Um, the ending point for federal taxes is usually the beginning point for people as they, as they prepare their state taxes. Um, for example, the, in Washington right now, there's a proposal uh, by the Trump administration that would include uh, eliminating the deduction that folks take for state and local taxes paid. Right. Now, generally speaking, in the media, you hear um, the states that are mentioned um, who would be most affected in that arena are in places like New York and New Jersey um, that have much higher um, state um, income tax structures. However, you know, in Virginia, um, we still have, we have communities with some fairly significant um, local property taxes that people pay. You know, in Northern Virginia, where property values are quite high, um, folks um, uh, who take that deduction, that's a significant one for them, and that would have a big impact on Virginians. And as you mentioned, federal sequestration has been the most significant economic challenge, I would argue, that the state has faced. We have not had the same recovery that we normally have after a recession in Virginia. So we very much are in uncharted territory this time. When you look at the job growth numbers and, uh, that we've seen, they've been m moderate at best, whereas we typically have bounced back fairly quickly after recessions. And those challenges posed by federal budget austerity measures and ongoing sequestration are going to continue to be a challenge for state lawmakers to figure out how we craft state policies that um, can make the investments we need to bring the economic growth that, uh, that is, is, is necessary to boost family incomes and provide a strong future for our kids. Let's, yes. Yeah, I was going to add on to that. And, and that's kind of the flip side of the, the equation here. We've been discussing the revenue challenges that Virginia has been facing for quite some time. And those impacts have been really keenly felt by our public schools. Um, during the recession, the state made very significant reductions in its support, pushing off a lot of the responsibility onto local governments to help support the schools. And not all local governments had the revenues available to help out with their school divisions. Um, during the, the height of the reductions in state support, it equaled over a billion dollars. Um, and most recently, lawmakers have started to kind of turn the corner on education funding in building support and momentum for public education. Um, but on a per-student basis, we've only filled in about 40 percent of the per-student cuts in real dollars. So that's less than half of what we were funding before the recession per student. Um, so there's still a long ways to go, and I think that's going to be a, a critical issue for the incoming governor to, to decide if they want to continue down the, the path of increasing and restoring our support for public education, or if they want to turn back on that recent progress. And having sufficient revenues to make these types of commitments is, is essential. Um, and we've seen from each of the candidates some fairly ambitious education platforms. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, both candidates um, of the Northam campaign and the Gillespie campaign have called for raising teacher raise, um, salaries. And um, that's important because Virginia trails the nation overall on average by 13 percent. And we're competing with other states as the nation is managing a teacher shortage. Um, so states like Pennsylvania and Maryland and Kentucky that have higher average salaries than Virginia is, we're, we're you know, at a loss in competing for those, those types of positions. Um, but it, it costs money to raise teacher salaries. Just last legislative session, a 2% pay increase for teachers and state workers was initially written in to start at the beginning of the biennium, um, and that had a projected cost of $134 million. Um, but because revenues, again, did not come in as much as they were needed, they had to delay that. And the overall investment went from $134 million down to $32 million. And so it's going to be very difficult to come follow through with raising teacher salaries if you're also calling for very significant reductions in the revenues the state has. And, and again, we encourage the viewers to, after the show, to go on and look at the half sheets. Mm -hmm. uh, on your site, because I think you have, again, you have a nice chart for each of the mm -hmm. three gubernatorial candidates, and um, all for public education, but, but each with some different policies. Mm -hmm. Yes, and one of the other resources for your viewers is um, 
Chris has completed a detailed analysis for every school division in the state that is a simple, easy to read, one page infographic that pulls together important information around these trends mm -hmm. uh, regarding state support for education in every community in this commonwealth, as well as other key trends that are relevant to that local school division. You know, the growth in student enrollment, the, the, num the growth in kids uh, on free and reduced lunch, or other um, uh, challenges that a community might face. And that gives folks a snapshot of where their particular school division stands in terms of these challenges of turning the corner f uh, for state investments in public education. And we also try to highlight what I think has been the biggest impact from these, the dollar reductions that I mentioned, which is staffing changes. Um, overall, our staffing levels in our schools have not kept pace with student enrollment, and um, staffing ratios, therefore, have fallen for teachers, principals, school counselors. If we had maintained our staffing levels from 2009, we'd have over 10,000 more positions in our schools across the state, more than 4,000 teachers. And so we identify each of the, the situation challenges that each school division is in in terms of staffing. This coming session is a time for what's called re-benchmarking. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are people in the money committees, appropriations, and Senate finance that are already, as they're wrestling with that and figuring what that's going to cost, as well as the Governor McAuliffe's administration. And then coupled with that, with the State Board of Education changing, recommending changes in the standards of quality that relate to what you say to, to staffing needs. Mm -hmm the additional money that's going to be desired for public education is going to be a significant increase to be sure mm -hmm. and and again it'll it'll fall on the incoming governor and the the 2018 general assembly yes absolutely and i think that's a really important point that you raised up is that the virginia board of education has already taken action to try to restore support for schools and make sure that schools have adequate staffing um, for the, the many needs of their students. And so they've adjusted um, the requirements for um, school nurses, school counselors, to make sure that every school has a nurse in their building and they're not sharing so that every student has access to um, health care services from a trained professional. Um, they've also adjusted these ratios for principals and assistant principals to make sure that schools have appropriate leadership. Um, but what hasn't followed um, after making these adjustments are the dollars. And so we're still waiting on that. That's right. Uh, without getting too deep into the weeds, as they, they would say, the 2017 session was to be the time, according to the code, that they would make those adjustments. Board of Education had their recommendations. They went nowhere because the money wasn't there, as you exactly. pointed out. And so they, the, the code was changed to make the even year, to make 2018 the year to bring forth those changes. And some are already questioning whether the money is going to be there in 2018 right. to make those changes. Right. And the 2018 session is going to be the one where the General Assembly deliberates over and builds the state's next two-year budget. And so that is a window of opportunity to really um, tee up these issues and make sure we have a robust conversation in our state around what should the future of public education look like in Virginia? What are the investments the state needs to make in order to uh, fulfill its commitment to educating kids in our state and to, as Chris said, continue down this path that we finally turned a corner on, um, on the state restoring some of the deep cuts that were made during the recession and uh, so that leaves the open question, are we going to continue that down that path of making progress in making the investments in what we know is essential for um, success and educational opportunity and for the economy as a whole? If each of you took 20 to 30 seconds before we close and saying, what do you think is the biggest challenge for the incoming administration and the incoming General Assembly, what would be? Why don't we start with you? What's the biggest challenge? Um, I think a, a, a large challenge is going to be um, gathering the political will to invest in the priorities that many of these candidates have identified. Uh -huh. um, and that's going to be difficult within the General Assembly and maybe perhaps within their own administration. Okay. 
Yeah, I think Chris really hit the nail on the head with a lot of that. Um, just finding ways to come together and um, invest in the type of future that they want for Virginia, that we all want for Virginia. I think the federal government and its policy proposals and posture remains a huge threat to Virginia. Um, not only federal budget austerity measures, but also efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, um, to um, reform federal tax policy that would have outsized impact on states. All of those, I think, are a critical issue that are on the radar. Thank you, all three. And, and we, as we would say to our viewers, stay tuned to see what's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. For Thank you. <laughs>